applauding. <coughs> You've not heard me yet. Right then, uh, my tenuous Scottish connection. Apparently, my grandmother was Scottish. But the evidence for this is that she had a, a pronounced brogue and a very pronounced, uh, what they call a burr to her accent. The other half of the family say she was an incipient alcoholic, and that's the evidence for that. <laughs> However, so you've got another Sassanac up on the, on the table today. But carrying on this theme of national exceptionalism, of Scotland, of Great Britain, of Britishness, whatever that means today, or whatever it meant uh, uh, back in uh, 1914, 1918, and the idea of empire, talk today is going to look at the Canadian core and ask the question of, does national exceptionalism actually make any difference in a war as colossal and on such a scale as this? So, let's have a look at what we've got here. I was told by Bob that I had to have a, a specifically Scottish slant to this, and I'm thinking, well, what can I do? So being a top-class academic, I turned immediately to Wikipedia. <laughs> okay, the Scots were the third largest ethnic group living in Canada today. They were made of a much greater uh, uh, proportion back in 1914, 1918. Five million Canadians claim Scottish descent. Scottish slaves, the Vikings, were the first to set foot in what was known as Vinland. Um, the reason for being this was that they thought that they might be attacked, so they sent the Scots slaves in first to see if they were going to get, sh get uh, uh, arrows and slings at them. In 1622, Sir William Alexander attempts to establish New Scotland, now known as Nova Scotia. Prominent Scottish Canadians include Sir John Macdonald, the first Canadian Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie, which was uh, probably the first uh, Canadian radical, William McDougall, who's one of the fathers of the Confederation. On top of that, in the, uh, especially in the mid-19th century, uh, the Scots dominated business, industrial, social education and political life during this key period where Canada was developing. And in 1920, nearly 50% of Canada's industrial magnates were either Scottish-born or had Scottish-born fathers. So Scotland has had a very, very large influence on Canada itself. But the theme of this talk today is that none of that really matters. What really matters is the fact that in this war, it was a British war in this widest sense of England, Ireland, Scotland, uh, uh, Wales, also Australia, Canada, and the other dominions, and the rest of the empire. The Canadian Corps, shock army of the British Empire, so said historian Shane B. Schreiber. And indeed, Roy George himself said in his war memoirs, which were not very kind to Haig whatsoever, whenever the Germans found the Canadian Corps coming into line, they prepared for the worst. They were seen as an elite formation. I will quote Steve Badzi here on this particular case. He once said, I think it was way back in a film, TV program about Douglas Hayes that the colonials, not as a term we use today, but the colonials were capable of re leaping reasonably tall buildings in a single bound, <laughs> which is something of their reputation. So, we're going to have a look here at the case. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Vimy Ridge captured 5,816 prisoners. Now, Lloyd George's statement sums up this Superman myth of the Canadian Corps in the Great War. So, Canadian soldiers were superior, innately superior, because they were Canadian and therefore infused by Scottishness, to the imperial or rather English troops. Where the British failed, the Canadians succeeded. There's a very similar narrative used for the Australians and the whole of the Anzac myth. It's a great source of national pride and a key part of the identity of Canada. And it's essential contribution to Canada's sense of independent nationhood, especially Vimy Ridge. The case for the prosecution. There's a Canadian, you can tell, there he is. <laughs> Canadians, healthy, strong, lumberjacks in the great outdoors. They're motivated, they're well-led and commanded, they're aggressive, they're intelligent, they are democratic and independent, unlike their British counterparts. They are innovative, they are tactically and operationally superior to their British counterparts, and the commanders are very, very concerned about casualties, unlike the Butcher Haig. The British are all gap-toothed, consumptive wrecks from the dark satanic mills, or indeed the Clydeside uh, uh, dockyards. Why are they there? Well, we're here because we're here because we're here. They're badly led by rather stupid and callous donkeys. They preferred a better role rather than a good scrap. They're a bit dumb, a bit thick, really. And they were bound by class hierarchy, and therefore incapable of acting on their own initiative. They're tactically and operationally inferior and their commanders couldn't give a tinker's cuss about casualties. Or so this rather uh, exaggerated version goes, just to make the point. 
I'll give you an example of a Canadian soldier and uh, against a British soldier. There we have it. This is a Canadian soldier, so <laughs> victory at Vimy Ridge. And uh, we have here a British soldier receiving instruction in basic dress, not particularly <laughs> successful. Have a look more at the myth of this. First we look at the command. Now Vimy Ridge is central to the Canadian Superman myth. It's central to this idea of nationhood. The Canadian Corps was commanded at that time by General Sir Julian Bing, a cheerfully unintellectual, and I quote, British cavalryman. The Canadian Corps themselves were known as the Bing Boys. And Bing was brought in in May 1916 to transform what up until then had been a Canadian Corps' lacklustre performance. A performance which was so grim that they were thinking about breaking up the Corps itself and just distributing the divisions amongst the ordinary British Corps. Most of the key staff officers who helped develop the Canadian Corps were British. We have the uh, magnificently named Brigadier General Percy Paul Fletcher Blackwear Radcliffe and uh, Brigadier General C.H. Tim Harrington. Uh, the Chief Staff, also Brigadier General G.J. Farmer, the DA and QMG, the, um, uh, the uh, sort of genius behind uh, getting the Canadian Corps moving on the road, Lord Allenbrook, Cecil Romer, Sir John Dill, Edmund Ironside. All of these were British staff officers because Canada simply didn't have enough trained officers at the beginning of the war itself. So, next part of the mission is when is a Canadian not a Canadian? Well, we all know that the Scottish, well, at least 50% uh, uh, of them were. About 70% of Canadians at Vimy Ridge were actually British-born, including Scotland. A significant number emigrated to Canada during the emigration boom years of 1909 to 1913, from both England and uh, uh, from Scotland as well. Some examples were, being a northerner, I picked some from the north there, Billy Hutton, he was born in Bolton. He was a jacquard tackler at Messrs. Walter Mather Weaving Shed. He emigrated in 1911, but he wore a Canadian uniform and became part of the Canadian myth. Or oh, the Reverend D.R.J. Biggs, who was born in uh, Litchfield, was a clerk in Holy Orders in Stoke-on-Trent, and he emigrated in 1908. So this large-scale uh, emigration boom means that, uh, you know, that you're likely to hear a Scottish, voice, a Scottish accent or a Northern accent or even a Southern accent in the trenches at Vimy Ridge as you were a genuine Canadian accent. And most of the Canadian troops were not drawn from the frontier, but from the urban working classes, just like their British uh, counterparts. As was mentioned before, class distinction far more important than national distinction. What about the myth of the military machine, that somehow it was uniquely Canadian and that innate Canadianness made it into a better fighting machine? Well, of the guns and gunners, over 50% were British. Logistically, the Canadian Corps, just like every other corps, was entirely dependent upon strategic British support, administration, transport, equipment and supplies. Even if we look at the famous Vimy Ridge tunnels in the engineering, uh, these were built by British tunnelers initially under First Army control of mines G.C. Williams. And of the, uh, Vimy Ridge, we tend to forget that the British 24th Division also fought at Vimy Ridge. It was not a uniquely Canadian undertaking whatsoever. So how did this myth arise? Yes, I'm sure we've all seen this one, yes. <laughs> well, Lord George's statement about the myth of the superior colonials really fits very neatly with the post-war lions led by Donkey's school of thought. This has been perpetuated by the Canadians due to national pride and the role of the core of Vinny Ridge as central to the nationhood of Canada. As Charles Stacey, one of the uh, most important Canadian uh, uh, historians, and said, Canadian nationalism was born on the battlefield of Vimy Ridge. Now, the myth makes it difficult to understand the true role and contribution of the Canadian Corps and their place within the BEF. I shall quote here some uh, less than uh, flattering uh, uh, quotes, one from General Horn, the uh, uh, First Army. Uh, the Canadian Corps is perhaps rather apt to take all the credit it can for everything and to consider that the BF consists of the Canadian Corps and some other troops. <laughs> Even Captain Bernard Law Montgomery, who we've heard about before, the Canadians are a queer crowd, they seem to think they are the best troops in France. I was disappointed in them. <laughs> so, let's have a look at the idea of the Canadian Corps itself. Because Shane B. Shriver's words about it being shock army of the empire, especially in 1918, actually ring true. It was a very, very efficient unit. But it's why it became a very efficient unit that we find it's most interesting. And the fact is that being Canadian or Scottish has very little to do with it. 
The Canadian Corps had unique advantages, which no other corps or even unit or formation in the British Army had. The Canadian Corps was Canada's army in the field. Make no mistake about that. It was stable, it was permanent, and it was homogenous. This allowed relationships to develop both vertically and horizontally. They got to know each other as, admin as individuals and also administratively. British corps, on the other hand, for those of you who don't know, are effectively a hollow shell into which our divisions are stuffed according to need. If you're on a quiet front, then that corps will probably consist of one or two divisions. As it's an active front, in active operations, it can consist up to five different corps. You'll be moved in and out of different corps all the time. Therefore, no particular relationship exists between the divisions of a corps and the corps itself. <coughs> They were responsible, in effect, to the Canadian Prime Minister and not to Haig. On paper they are, in reality it's a very different kettle of fish. They were also lavishly equipped and supported, proportionately more so than any other British corps. They also had the benefit of advanced technology, especially we see this in use to say the railway battalions. Um, this is the use of, with proximity to both the US and Great Britain. It gave them the best of both worlds. So they're kind of high tech, they're lavishly equipped and supported, and they have effectively a different channel of communications than that of the British divisions or British Corps. They were also unaffected by the 1918 manpower cuts. In 1918, those of you who know, uh, the Hague was forced to reduce the number of battalions in a brigade from four down to three, effectively losing about 25% of his infantry. This was not the case for the Canadians. They also understood the crucial <coughs> operational dominance of engineering and artillery and the components of that, logistics. They were also, by and large, allowed much greater time to prepare and train. As we know, preparation prevents per, per, you know, the poor performance, I've left out the obvious word, um, but also training is key, and training is a theme we see throughout 1916, 1917, and the lack of training facilities and the time taken to train is a very, very short indeed. They had particularly engineering and logistic expertise as well. Canada's, one of Canada's national symbols, of course, is the beaver, the ultimate engineering animal, as it were. And it's interesting to know that um, the uh, Colonel Bai of the Royal Engineers founded Bytown, which is modern-day Ottawa. Also particularly needed during the late 19th and early 20th century were the skills required to exploit Canada. Lumber, railways, administration, technology. So they've got this unique advantage in terms of their, in terms of their uh, structure, in terms of their administration, and the fact that they are unaffected by manpower cuts, also that they have their particular time and place as a nation. Now, unfortunately, gentlemen, size does matter, and the Canadian Corps was big. It was very, very big. In fact, it was approaching the size of a British army. It had four oversized divisions, Whereas the British Corps could only expect to have two or three divisions normally. The average divisional strength in 1917 was between 21 and 22,000, rising up to 25,000 in some cases. Now in 1917, a British division fielded, technically on paper, order of battle, 18,000 men. In reality, that number was considerably, le considerably less, about 15,000 or thereabouts. So they're a much bigger one and they kept those divisions up to strength. They had much more proportionately of everything as a consequence of this. They had especially in terms of artillery. Now, divisional line infantry strength comparison in 1917 gives you some idea. In an imperial division, in practice, you will have 500 to 900 in a battalion. As a Canadian division, when I went through the papers, I could never find it dropping below 1,120. A brigade, 2,500 to 3,600 and thereabouts. Canadian brigades, 4,500 or upwards. So the infantry in a, in, a, in a division will be 7,500 to 10,800 in a British division, or Imperial division as it was known, whereas their line infantry was 13,500. And as we can see, the actual divisional sizes vary dramatically as well. So the Canadian Corps was big, and that made it resilient. That meant it could go into battle and it could absorb losses. It also meant it could rotate its divisions in and out and still be an effective corps, something that was denied to many, many British corps. But to begin with, though, the Canadian reputation was nothing like what came out in the post-war area. I'm going to look at the Affair of Saint-Louis in 1916 to demonstrate just the unique elements of the Canadian corps. Now, 
The performance of their first commander, General E.H. Uh, e. Calderson, was poor. Battle of Festubert did not go well. They failed to hold their gains. Unsurprisingly, since they are a new division constructed out of uh, volunteerism in uh, Canada. Uh, in March 1916, the British managed to capture the crater positions at saint louis south of Ypres. But in April 1916, the Canadians lose possession of those uh, craters in a masterpiece of tragicomic incompetence. This affair was airbrushed out of history in both the British and Canadian official histories, part of the propaganda system that was talked about earlier. And it was conveniently forgotten by Canadian historians, but it's worth a closer look to see one of the advantages that they have. Now, the affair at saint louis part one, the third imperial division. Now, on 26th of September, sorry, 27th of March, six mines were blown at, blown at saint louis The British third division, the 9th Brigade, attacked simultaneously. The state of the ground, though, left these craters four and five unoccupied by either side for three days. The state of the ground at saint louis is absolutely incredible. It's so difficult to traverse that people did not know where they were. Here's the craters themselves. Uh, it's not particularly good photograph this, but we have craters one, two, three, four, and five there. And there's the attack. Now, on the 30th of March, the 3rd Division established a machine gun post in Crater 4, which is uh, just this one here, and uh, uh, Germans occupied Crater 5, this one here. So we have something of an impasse at this point. Now, on the 3rd of April, after savage fighting, the 3rd Division manages to capture Crater 5 here. And the 3rd Division Fire Corps was so exhausted by this that the Canadians were relieved, decided to bring the Canadians to relieve them as uh, earlier, much earlier than was planned. There's a picture of what it is. The map, we can see, is one thing. The reality, this aerial photograph taken in April, is a very much a different thing. Crater 1 is just off the uh, map here. We see Crater 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and Crater 7 is just over there somewhere. That I have tried to look at. I've been on the ground. In fact, I was in St. Saloui just the other day trying to understand this. And after about four, four or five attempts, I just gave up trying to understand it. So what it was like for them at the time is miraculous. Now then, looking at part two. The Canadians from the 3rd to the 6th of April. Now, R.E.W. Turner's 2nd Canadian Division relieved the 3rd Division on the night of the 3rd to the 4th. And the 6th Canadian Per Brigade were occupying this crater sector. Now, General Haldane, commanding officer of 3rd Division, advises Turner to consolidate a strong line in front of the craters themselves. Brigadier General Ketchin, who was the commanding officer of 6th Canadian Brigade, believes the German counterattack will come from a different part of the line, the bluff. Ketchin ignores Haldane and forms temporary defensive line on the rear lips of the craters. So he completely ignores his advice given to him by, by a, a much more experienced commander and put this defensive line on the rear lips of the craters. On the 5th of April, at 11 p.m., the Germans opened up an intense barrage, the uh, counter-attack that was expected, and attacked at 3.30 a.m. on the 6th of April. Yeah, I'll give you some idea of the conditions here. I've got a, a quote by Private Donald Freyfazer of the uh, 31st Calgary Battalion. When day broke, the sights that met our gaze were so horrible and ghastly, they beg a description. Heads, arms, and legs were protruding from the mud at every yard, and dear knows how many bodies the earth swallowed. Thirty corpses were at least showing in the crater, and beneath the clay waters, other victims must be lying killed and drowned. A vivid description of conditions. Now, the Germans broke Ketchin's weak defences, unsurprisingly, and captured craters 2, 3, 4, and 5. A classic reverse of the Western Front. The Canadians believed themselves to be occupying craters 4 and 5, but they were actually occupying craters 6 and 7. And again, we've got a picture here. Just after the German bombardment, we can see these even further obliteration here. There's crater 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. It's the reverse, as it were, of the other picture. Now, based upon this false information, the Canadians ordered to occupy craters 2 and 3. Canadian attacks on the 8th to the 15th of April, an entire week of fighting, led to, savage, uh, led to a puzzling lack of any success, though. Where was the success? The real position was not confirmed until the 15th and 16th of April, and all further attacks were cancelled. And on the 19th of April, just to add insult to injury, the Germans captured craters 6 and 7, and fighting died down. So far, so good. You could say that this is an untried, untested set of divisions, and that this is the consequence of fighting on the Western Front. Attack, 
counterattack, confusion, lack of voice control, all the problems you find in just about any battle up until 1917. So, second division indeed, it's an experience. No communication between front and rear. Ketchin's defences were very poor. And the commanding officer, second decade division, Der Turner, should have ordered a thorough reconnaissance because of this. Third British position handed over a very poor line, but Turner regarded this as a trivial matter. Turner should have made it clear that this line is untenable against the Germans. But Turner had also been previously criticised for poor, for poor performance at Second Ypres as well. And so an inquiry is launched, as it should be. And it's clear that the main fault lies with Turner and that he should be sacked. Now, the inquiry. Maps Aitken, otherwise known as Lord Beaverbrook, cables Canadian militia to Minister Sam Hughes, the British view St. Lois as a serious breakdown and that heads must roll. Plumer himself was close to being sacked uh, by Haig. Plumer orders Alderson to take severe disciplinary measures. Alderson is, of course, the commander of the Canadian Corps at this moment. Now, Plumer wants Turner and Ketchin sacked for incompetence and orders a report on this. All so good so far. The report, unsurprisingly, damns Ketchin, and Alderson demands his sacking, but Turner refuses to support the report findings. So we're in the position where the Brigadier, Brigadier General has been damned by the report. Commander of the uh, Canadian Corps demands his sacking, but Turner, the uh, divisional commander, refuses to support the uh, findings. The Alderson-Turner relationship by now was very, very poor. And Alderson goes to Hague requesting Turner be removed for insubordination, an extraordinary move under the circumstances. So what happens? Murky politics is what happens. Haig shows political <coughs> astuteness in this case and refuses Alderson. Turner is a Canadian VC hero. And if he supports Alderson, there will be a backlash in an Anglo-Canadian feud at a time when we need every single man in support of operations. Remember, Canada is not required to come to Britain's aid by any legal mechanism. It's a decision Canada has made itself. And recruiting there is very, very enthusiastic. This will therefore put our recruiting uh, um, efforts in Canada in a difficult position. It was decided, therefore, it is better to retain incompetent commanders than risk a political backlash. Max Aitken concurs, and Sam Hughes already despises Alderson anyway. Alderson is British, not Canadian. Result, Alderson is sacked and replaced by Sir Julian Byng. Turner, though, was eventually promoted back to England in December 1916, so he didn't get away with it entirely. But we can see there how murky politics and the greater needs of maintaining the British forces in their wider sense has uh, uh, dealt with the situation and has also demonstrates as well Canada's unique position in this and the Canadian Corps' unique position. What about the Somme? Well, it can all be called slow, painful improvement. The Canadian Corps fought during these latter stages, not the, uh, not the main battle itself. 16th at Flair Corps Select. Uh, September in Thietval, October 1916, Regina Trench. Operations tended to be piecemeal, rushed and dogged by poor signals communication. Exactly the same problems that the British units were finding during the earlier period of fighting on the Somme. The results were at best, put in their best light, adequate, but at least it represented an improvement of sorts, of sort, although again at a very, very high cost. One thing the Canadian Corps began to do at this moment, though, which was again, which was, uh, uh, if you like, in advance of the main forces of the BF there, they began to pool their divisional assets and they're acting as a single corps rather than four divisions. What does this mean? Quite simply, instead of having four sets, four divisional sets of artillery, they would pool them under one commander. Same with their engineers. Rather than their engineering uh, field companies being left with a single division, they would be pooled together. And pooling, in other words, creating and using your assets to your, at the operational level became one of the hallmarks of the Canadians at this particular time. Now, in winter of 1916-1917, you could say that there was a birth of a shock army of sorts. As with the rest of the BF, the Somme was a watershed for the Corps as they engaged in this painful post-battle analysis. 
It's described by Canadian historian Tim Cook as the key pivotal moment in the Canadian Corps. Bing ordered every battalion, artillery and infantry brigade and division to conduct courts of inquiry. Quite a, quite a, quite a move on behalf of what was known as a cheerfully unintellectual cavalryman. And therefore, I think, challenging the notion of the British cavalryman being the epitome of the butchers of the First World War. Every single operation element was re-examined and BEF-wide lessons were circulated and absorbed. That is important. These were not necessarily Canadian lessons. These were BEF-wide lessons which were circulated constantly up, down and across in order to make everybody more efficient at tactical and the operational level. Bing also understood that if the Canadian Corps was to survive and not be broken up after the losses of the Somme, it must improve. So what were the results? Well, Bing identified the key issues and instituted improvements. P meticulous planning and preparation. Integration of all arms, including supporting arms. No longer were uh, the engineers required to work separately from the infantry, the gunners separate from the rest of the infantry as well. Improved, continuous and intensive training. The artillery itself must be overwhelming, integrated and aimed at suppressing the enemy rather than destroying them. So John French uh, uh, originally said that breaking through the line was largely a question of the expenditure of high explosive ammunition. No amount of expenditure of high explosive ammunition was going to break through this line. You now have to suppress, to blind, to dazzle the uh, defenders. There will be maximum use and improvement of technology in this respect. Decentralisation of command and a strong stress on infantry other ranks using their initiative rather than simply waiting for orders was also stressed. Improved signals communication, improved infantry tactics based around the new specialised platoon structure. The transformation, uh, this transformed the Canadian Corps, uh, this would get its first test at Vimy Ridge. But I stress again, every single unit formation in the BEF was doing exactly the same thing. It's whether or not they had the ability and the resources to do this. They all knew the lessons, and these lessons were not the lessons of the Canadian Corps, they were the lessons of everyone of the, that fought throughout 1916 and the accumulation of lessons from 1940. So let's have a look at Vimy Ridge. Interesting photograph there. Canadian troops you know, captured uh, Germans on Vimy Ridge on 9th of April 1917. You cannot underestimate the importance of Vimy to the reputation of the Canadian Corps, and you cannot underestimate the importance of Vimy to Canada as a nation. Canadian nationalism was forged at Vimy Ridge. And Canada is awash with streets, roads, buildings, towns, and even a mountain all named after Vimy. In fact, Canadian government order Bill C-227 in 2003 declared April the 9th a national holiday known as Vimy Day. What was the Vimy Ridge method? Set-piece assault, lavish and flexible use of artillery, counter-battery fire was crucial, careful preparation, use of deception and surprise to suppress rather than, and uh, neutralise rather than destroy, Use of limited operations. Don't go any further than your artillery can support you. Use and encouragement of initiative. Maps being issued down to uh, you know, sergeants and other NCOs. That movement and supply dependent upon the engineers. That proper rest, care and support of troops. And training, 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 training and more training. That took time to perfect. But again... These are lessons being learned throughout the BEF and being distributed out through the BEF. The number of pamphlets and the stationary series that comes out, SS 158, SS so on and so forth, is quite astonishing. So this is not a uniquely Canadian thing. What they did have, though, was that size and resilience and special political, um, what's the phrase I'm going to look for, um, protection, which other core and other uh, formations did not have. Battle of Arras, 1917. Well, we know it is a, a great, great achievement, but it's interesting to note that, we just point out here where it takes place, this is the uh, length of front of the Battle of Arras here, all the way down through there, down as far as 5th Army there. Vimy Ridge takes up one small portion of it. Here we have, running down from the north to south, 4th, 3rd, 2nd and 1st Canadians. Yeah? who indeed do a magnificent operation and do take a lot of, do effectively render Vimy Ridge useless for the Germans themselves. Let's move on. There's a view of the ridge itself. Now the interesting thing about this is that it gives 
there is protection given by the Suchet Valley at the back there. And also, the density of the German systems here, they have not yet introduced their defence in depth system. So these are all, if you like, stonewall held uh, 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 trenches. The other thing to note is that once you get to the ridge itself, there's an enormous drop off towards the Dwy Plain, and it effectively becomes untenable. If they can get forward there, then they can actually take the ridge itself. They had colossal artillery support, more so than any other corps on the Western Front during the Battle of Arras. The Canadians had 983 guns, 245 of them heavy. The Germans only had 212 guns at this point. A 20-day bombardment, a million shells were fired, 50,000 tons. Fairly small beer compared to what's coming down the line. <coughs> they also used silent 18-pounder batteries which were pushed forward into trenches. Uh, right at the very front, they were not registered, or they were registered under fire uh, of other, other uh, guns themselves, so that when they moved forward, they would have continual artillery support all the way through. But again, this is not news. This was used at the Battle of Luz, haphazardly, by various divisions, but it's nothing new. <coughs> there was an outstanding artillery deception plan. The artillery suppression, not destruction again, I stress that point, and this was integrated with equally colossal trench mortar and machine gun barrages with a creeping barrage to protect the troops. All of this was familiar to just about any division or corps on the Western Front during the Battle of Arras, 1917. <coughs> Give you an idea of the complexity of the barrage themselves, this is uh, actually one taken from October 1917, but it gives you some idea. 66% of your 18 bounders were part of the A barrage there. In front of that, there was another B1 barrage, 33% of your 18 pounders. So that's the second line. <coughs> a B2 barrage consisting of 4.5 inch howitzers, with now your third line. There's 100 diff yards difference between each one. And there was a C barrage of machine guns in front of that by 100 yards. The reason behind that was quite simple. Even though the British and the troops were protected as they advanced forward underneath this barrage, if the Germans saw a barrage coming towards them, they would man their parapets and shoot into it. With a machine gun barrage ahead of that, then they would run the risk of running into the machine gun barrage as the uh, main uh, artillery barrage approached. There were then D barrages and E barrages with 200 yard gaps, six inch howitzers for the next line, uh, eight inch, 9.2 inch howitzers. In all, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven distinct lines of fire, specific fire <coughs> thrown into an eight line of fire, and beyond that, counter battery fire itself, an astonishing achievement. And as was pointed out, many of these barrages are not just moving forward, they're also sweeping back or been coming in from the flanks in order to deceive the Germans as to what was happening. Now, counter battery fire is crucial to success. The German guns must be suppressed. And there was a General A. McNaughton there, that's not a Scottish name, and uh, he created, uh, he was in, created a, a CBSO, a counter-battery office, and he was a counter-battery staff officer under the command of this man. He used the latest sound-ranging flash-spotting techniques. Colonel H.H. H. Hemming he used flash-spotting Lawrence Bragg with sound-ranging. What this meant was that in, con in concert with the Royal Flying Corps, they could observe from above, and if they couldn't serve from above, they could observe by sound or by flash. Let's give them three methods of observing German fire and zeroing on their positions. There were dedicated Royal Flying Corps observation and photographic flights. 83% of the enemy guns were neutralised before zero hour. Another 47 guns were neutralised after zero hour. Again, I stress, this is nothing particularly Canadian. It's BEFY. One of the advantages they really did have was the troops were endlessly trained. The raids are part of the training. Canadians were absolute raid freaks. They used to love raiding. Royal Flying Corps photographs were used to construct copies of German positions and attacks were practiced. All troops were required to examine scale models of the rich. The new platoon system was instituted and perfected and 40,000 maps were issued down to NCO level. There was very, very close liaison with uh, other arms. And at zero hour, all infantry had confidence in supporting arms and knew exactly what they did and how to do it. Of this, oops, sorry, press the wrong button there. Of this, there are two elements where the Canadians had an advantage. One, the sheer size of the Corps meant that those troops could be endlessly trained because they had the manpower both to man the line and also provide the carrying parties which were increasingly absorbing more and more and more infantry as more and more material, more and more shells arrived at the front. 
Whereas around amongst the rest of the BEF, training was beginning to break down because of the colossal demands placed on a limited pool of infantry. In the Canadian Corps, this was not the case. The second uh, advantage they've got there is this very close liaison with other arms. Because Corps was now becoming the centre of gravity of battle. Prior to that, it had been division. The operations are now so enormous, so huge, that Corps becomes the centre of gravity. And as I mentioned before, British corps were really shells. There was no relationship between the divisions in those corps and the, the actual corps itself. Not so in the Canadian Corps. This is, makes it an integrated and homogenous unit, and therefore it has a tremendous advantage in this respect. The one thing they did understand was logistics and engineering. I knew you'd get around to it eventually. It was an enormous logistic and engineering effort. And it was recognised by Bing and Curry as the essential factor in what was known as an engineer's war. And the Canadian Corps had proportionately more logistics and engineering personnel than any other formation. They were also the pioneers of the light railways. They were light railway freaks, as described by W.K. Davis in his books. They had a huge light railway system, and indeed the British Army light railway system was basically based upon the pattern of the Canadian one. There was also a very large focus on getting roads and tracks repaired. However, to make the point of the devastation that was unleashed, those rebuilding of roads onto Vimy Ridge was still being undertaken in June of 1917, some uh, six weeks after the actual initial assault itself. The advantage the Canadian Corps have here is they have proportionately more uh, specific personnel for logistics and engineering. That means that the engineers and the logisticians can get on with their job. On top of that, as well, the chief engineer of the Canadian Corps, Sir William Beth uh, uh, the Bethune, he uh, was given command no other British unit has command in that respect. The chief engineer of a corps level does not have a command. He's an advisor, whereas he can command, and that makes a big difference. So what were the results of Vivi Ridge? It's an overwhelming victory. The whole ridge was taken on April, by April, the 12th of April. The Germans were unable to respond, and all their counterattacks were defeated, and it's used as the operational model for the Messines battle in June of 1917. The casualties were still very heavy, but it's leastly a clear victory. But we have to remember that much of the hard work was done by the French and the British, especially the French in 1915, and also the British in 1960. And above that, it was a limited and self-limiting operation. Because of that drop down to the Dwy Plain, yeah, there's no way that the, the uh, Corps could pursue the Germans beyond that point. So it's a limited operation in that it had a single point to take. And it was self-limiting because there was no need to prepare for a follow-up battle after that. A reality check amongst all this glory of taking Vimy Ridge. It was not taken in one day. It actually took four days to take. There were problems on the 9th of April. On the 9th of April, the 4th Canadian Division attacking the northern sector collapsed almost immediately. Unsuppressed machine gun fire caused heavy casualties to begin with. The pimple, another feature, was not actually finally captured until the 12th of April, and the northern portion of Hill 145, where we see the uh, great monument, was not taken, and 3rd Canadian Divisional Flank was exposed. Vimy itself, Vimy Village, was retaken by the Germans at 6 p.m. There were also problems on the following day. 4th Canadian Division capture Hill 145, but they lose it again to German counterattacks. The Germans themselves withdrew from Hill 145 in the evening because they realised that they are being outflanked by the Canadians. So it is not the clear-cut victory that, if we like, the modern myth, the modern nationalistic myth, has created. There were difficulties. One thing I'd like to point out, these limited bite-and-hold operations, the idea of taking one chunk of land supported by your artillery, are not cheap. The total casualties were 10,602 of which 3,500 were killed and 7,000 wounded. This creates a false impression as the Canadian Corps were engaged in the battle through aggressive and costly raiding policy from January onwards. For them, the battle begins way back in January. A reasonable estimate of the real cost of taking Vimy Ridge from January to April 1917 would be about double the above. So about 20,000 casualties, 7,000 killed, 14,000 wounded. At Passchendaele. As we all know, Passchendaele, the Canadians, what the British could not do, the Canadians came and did. This is a picture of, uh, a very famous picture of Private Reg Lebrun, here's the chap there. 
and his, his uh, machine gun section. It's sad to say that just about every single one of these men were, were dead within a few days of this photograph being taken. As we know at Passchendaele, 3rd Ypres, after 12th of October, the BF were exhausted but still needed to take Passchendaele Bridge. The 5th Army had attacked back on the 31st of uh, July. They'd made some inroads initially, but the usual, if you like, arithmetic of the Western Front begins to wait. They pushed too far forward, therefore they were exposed to German counter-battery fire. They were thinned out and they were pushed back. Then there was a slogging match up until April, until uh, uh, middle August. Then, of course, we know General Plumer was brought in, given time to prepare, and had a series of very successful battles, beginning with the Battle of Menin Road on the 20th of September, but which ended on the, in the, uh, the, the disastrous battles of the 9th and 12th of October 1917, where initially uh, uh, the uh, uh, 66th Division and the uh, 48th Division couldn't push through on the 9th and were slaughtered. My grandfather was amongst them. And again, when we see the Anzacs attack on the 12th of October, there is an abject failure there. Now, Curry was asked to do it by Haig. And he says he will do so only if given time and resources to prepare. Curry is now the commanding officer of the Canadian Corps. He will not attack until roads and tracks are improved, extended and repaired, artillery moved to within 2,500 yards of the Germans, and 8,000 tons of ammunition stockpiled near the guns. He wants the wire cut and he wants the weather improved as well. If this is done, then he can attack on the 26th of October. This is a hell of a, 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 you know, a demand to be made by a corps commander of the BEF, but it's a measure of the political power that he has that he can actually get this and it's provided for him. So, a colossal engineering effort is, take, is undertaken where just about every division in the salient becomes a labouring gang for the Canadian Corps themselves. And it's, again, important Curry has the political clout to do this in a way that no other formation has. Now, preparation, a worm's eye view, on the, on the of the time. The world of the working party has been pretty much ignored in favour of the battle. This is one of the reasons I've looked at logistics and looked at preparation and looked at how the structure and infrastructure supporting the battle in this modern industrial environment is in what's why it's so important. Battle, though, takes up only a fraction of a soldier's time. Most of the time, a soldier is not a soldier, he is a labourer. <laughs> so what was it like preparing for Passchendaele? Well, Private P.H. Longstaff, the 2nd Canadian Division Ammunition Column, gives you some idea. 21st of October, up at 2.30am, very dark, breakfast, start at 3.15, long walk past transports and ammunition column, arrive at dump at 4.30, work on Plank Road, Huge guns all around, mud awful, dead men and horses all around, thousands of men working, rush job on the road through the swamp, ammunition mules and horses passing continuous stream, uh, Fritz shelling both sides of the road. 22nd of October, up at 2.30, drizzle of rain, Fritz overhead, same work as 21st of October, arrive 4.15, terrific bombardment opens up, exciting scenes as mules and horses flounder in mud, wrecked tanks and pillboxes all around, Worked on roads, sandbags and carrying planks. Shells dropping quite close. Up to our knees in mud. Shell on road, three killed, five injured. Horrible sights. Quit at 11 a.m. Now, this man should have been actually running on an ammunition column. He wasn't. He was wiring, sandbagging. In fact, it really didn't matter where you were. Labour was everything in trying to get across the Passchendaele swamp in this case. But... This is what modern artillery does to the battlefield. And when you have an artillery intensive system, this is what you will create, which is why the engineering effort is so important. By this time, the exhaustion was beginning to tell amongst the British Army. Again, one of the uh, uh, <coughs> advantages the Canadian Corps has is this large group of men. So they can constantly rotate men and continue training them as well. Well, there were three short set piece assaults. First assault on the 26th of October, three days interval between the first and the second attack in order to move everything forward, four days minimum to second and third attack. The advances were between 500 and 1,000 yards per assault. And they actually, in the end, it required four assaults because one of the assaults was not too bright. The artillery begins bombardment on the 16th of October, intensifying from the 21st of October. And this is a realistic approach given the conditions. It's realistic also because the Canadian Corps were allowed to do this. In the case of the attack by, um, uh, 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 on the 9th and 12th of October, these were horrendously rushed. 
commanders knew they were, corps commanders were. Uh, and so what happened there was the preparation was not done, it was not completed, and then the whole thing ended in disaster. In this case, a realistic approach was taken because Curry had the clout to do so. I'll quickly run through the battle of itself. You can see itself. The main problem here you have is the spurs, the famous <coughs> spurs of Passchendaele. Bellevue spur, uh, just there. Goodberg spur, Passchendaele village itself is up there. Crest farm is just there. And around about here is the line of the uh, Radbeck and uh, Waterfield swamp. You can see because they're a four division they, and they're, they're quite resilient, you can put the 3rd Canadian and the 4th Canadian divisions in first. On the 30th of October, they pushed forward. 3rd and 4th Division, they again moved in. <coughs> by the 6th and the 10th of November, they were replaced by 1st and 2nd Canadian Division, relatively fresh troops, and they pushed forward through the line that was initially achieved on the 6th of October and then uh, moved out on the 10th of November. It is a long, hard slog made possible only by those preparatory factors and the fact that every other division and in that part of the sector was effectively a Canadian labouring engineering division. Passchendaele, cost and consequences. 16 days of fighting, casualties 15,500. It confirmed the central roles of artillery and counter-battery fire, infantry training and initiative, all arms cooperation and the weight of firepower. It's interesting to note that the Canadians <coughs> also faced the same problems and to a great some degree made the same mistakes as the BEF did on the 9th and the 12th of October, despite all their preparation and advantage. They very nearly at one point achieved the same results. The Australians complained about the Canadians and said they laid the groundwork for so that we have an interesting case of national uh, arguments going on there, when in fact this was a BEF success of sorts. The importance of Passchendaele is engineering. It's more or less the same operational system developed at Vimy Ridge and honed at Hill 70 in August and is used at Passchendaele. The importance of Passchendaele is in engineering terms. How to cross ground which is devastated by that weight of fire. Now, Chief Engineer William Bethune Lindsay produced a report called the Lindsay Report. It's actually called Methods of Distribution of Ammunition Used November 1917, which is one of the most tedious titles I've ever come across and I very nearly skipped over it when I was doing my research. <coughs> And it was about engineering and the need to expand engineering assets dramatically. Curry supports this. This is where we begin to depart from this idea of the Canadian Corps is merely a, 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 a recipient of the advantages of its unique position, but otherwise another BEF unit that learned from the BEF. Now then, <coughs> what they decided to do was that if necessary, they will cut infantry in favour of engineers. And this becomes the key factor for Canadian victories in 1918. This idea of it being an engineer's war. It also, there was a need for engineering centralisation and command and control at the core level. Interestingly enough, throughout the BEF, this was done in throughout 1916 and 1917. We see command and control of artillery being moved from divisions up to core level itself. However, operational engineering was vital to the success of the artillery, and the artillery is vital to the success of infantry. But engineering was left with divisions. Quite shockingly, when we stop and think about this, the highest level of engineering command that there was was a captain in a field company. Each division had three field companies. There's a few hundred men in each one. That's about 600, plus they also had a pioneer battalion. However, that control was dissipated down. At every other level above that, Commander Royal Engineer, um, Chief Engineer at, Canadian, at uh, Corps level, and at Army level, the engineer is an advisory, is an advisory position. The Ch Commander Royal Engineers of a division didn't even have his own motor car. He had to go and borrow one, despite the fact this was cited in 1915 as being one of the twin pillars of success, artillery and engineering. So, because engineering is left for divisions, the entire operational engineering becomes completely fragmented and incoherent and leads time and time again to operational failure. We cannot move the guns forward because we have roads not being built, tracks not being built, we have uh, brigade commanders with their attached uh, um, field companies deciding they want huts or they want this or they want that. There's no coherence whatsoever. And in this respect, this is the one area we can say the Canadian Corps was superior 
superior to the British because they decided that they would actually have command and control at the, at the core level and these would be core assets in effect. And this proved vital during 1918 because the Canadian Corps had the engineering assets to free the infantry to train and thus the Canadian Corps was always more battle effective than their British units. I'll give you an idea, divisional engineer strength comparison in 1918, Imperial Division has three field companies, 217 per company, 651 total strength. They also have Pioneers, one battalion, 761. So that's 1,412 engineers. The Canadian Division in 1918 has a brigade of engineers, 1,007 per battalion. That's 3,021's total strength. I've done some further research on this, and it actually is nearer 4,500. The Canadian Division Pontoon Bridging Transport Unit, the circuit 66 in its total, <coughs> brings it up to 3,000. It's actually nearer 4,500. So in effect, what we have there is that the Canadians had a fifth engineering division in 1918 in which to take to battle. This freed up the infantry for the vital training that was necessary during 1918, especially when we moved towards more flexible open warfare, and because of the resilience and its strong four, co its four divisional system, then it meant that they could continually go into action with at least two divisions, with two divisions resting. So, just press this forward. Concluding points, will the real Canadian Corps please stand up? Well, I'm going to make some contentious statements here. In 1917, the Canadian Corps had an easy time compared with their British counterparts. Vimy, enormous support was given, virtually all of 1st Army artillery. It's a self-limiting tactical operation, unlike the uh, rather larger operations for 1st uh, um, uh, first, uh, for first Army. Uh, German defences were very poorly handled, and the shallow penetration compared with the rest of the BEF at Arras. At Passchendaele, Canadian Corps had been rested between Vimy and Passchendaele, with the exception of Hill 70, which, was in, 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 which is really a diversion operation, and the task set was relatively minor, a two to 3,000 yard push. Again, it was a limited tactical operation. They were not required to break through or be the spearhead of anything. The argument to say is that given the resources that they had, given the political clout they had, given the structure of the entire corps itself, and given these relationships which were permanent, stable and homogenous, they should have actually done better and quicker. Colonial supermen, no better than their comparative elite imperial troops. Peter Simpkins again, in his analysis of Paddy Griffith's British fighting methods of the Great War. The 46th Division, known as, known as the goalkeepers after the disastrous showing at the Shom, of the Shom, of the Somme, um, and the 66th Division, now doing the pursuit to the South, both had excellent records. The learning curve, as it's known as, for what it's worth, everybody learned from everybody else. There were no pioneers. There were no leading lights moving forward. War was now too far too complex and interdependent business to be able to and say that the Scots fought better or because the natural warriors or the Canadian lumberjacks and outdoors fought better because the British were all silly and stupid. If we look at uh, locating enemy artillery, H.H. H. Hemming was a Canadian flash spotter, Lawrence Bragg with his English sound ranging. It was the integration of these and the dissemination of information which really, really mattered. So during 1918, at least, the Canadian Corps were an elite shock army but they had these unique advantages that have been denied to imperial formations. Had they had those advantages, and we're talking counterfactual history, but had they had those advantages, I see no reason why any other comparable corps could have done exactly the same. So they should be seen, using the uh, British political phrase, as first amongst equals rather than supermen themselves. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my talk for today. to find the private